The Ministry of Secondary Education has developed a distance learning platform in collaboration with MinPostel, CRTV, UNESCO and UNICEF for students of secondary education in Cameroon. A series of lessons taught by qualified teachers. For secondary school students, learning has never been easier with distance learning. An initiative by the Ministry of Secondary Education under the stewardship of Professor Pauline Nalova in collaboration with the Ministry of Post and Telecommunications, CRTV, and UNESCO. And UNICEF. We are introducing distance learning as another teaching and learning method which is different from the traditional classroom setting that you are all used to. In the distance education mode, you are not with the teacher in person, so take your time, relax, listen to the teacher, take down notes, and visit the following links for any questions or answers to your question. Take it in your stride. Danova Lyunga, Minister of Secondary Education. Welcome to this revision session. I am Bati Elvis Ebert, your geology teacher. Geology revision for GC ordinary level examination. Today we are continuing with phase four of our revision program. And phase four is on historical geology. And we shall be looking at the following topics under this phase. Paleontology, stratigraphy, and soils. Paleontology is a study of ancient life through the remains of one's living organisms called fossils. Paleontology has the following branches. One, paleobotany, micropaleontology, invertebrate paleontology, and vertebrate paleontology. Remember, we are studying the remains of fossils and fossils is the remain of a once living organism. And for an organism to be described as a fossil, it must have lived for at least 10,000 years. How can fossils be preserved? Fossils are preserved by the process of fossilization. And through this process, we have the following types of fossils. Index fossils, zonal fossils, fasci fossils, transported fossils, derived fossils, and trace fossils. As we can see from the picture there, we see the trace of the footprint of a dinosaur. That is another way we can study the remains of one's living organism. Nature, how can fossils be preserved? How can an organism actually be preserved to be called a fossil? One, the nature of the hard parts of the fossils. And for that hard part to be fossilized, it must either be calcareous, siliceous, or it must be shelly, chitinous, or either an organic hard part. For an organism to be fossilized, it must undergo certain conditions of fossilization. One, rapid burial. That is, when the organism dies, it must be buried quickly so that other organisms like predators or scavengers shouldn't feed on it. Because if this organism feed on it, we will not be able to have the, the organism preserved or buried. The second condition for organism to be fossilized is the abundance of the organisms. If the organism is few, we may not have them being represented in the fossil record. So for organisms to actually undergo fossilization, their number must be abundant. So that even if some dies, we can still have remains of other 
groups of other organisms that live in that particular group. Another condition for fossilization is the rock type. For organisms cannot be preserved in all types of rocks. For example, igneous and metamorphic rocks are not good rocks for which fossils can be preserved because these rocks have high temperatures and the metamorphic activities that go on can destroy these fossils. And so that rock type matters. And with this now, fossils are best preserved in sedimentary rocks with fine sediments. Another condition of fossilization is the size of the organism. If the organism is too large, like the size of an elephant, for example, we may not it may not be preserved when it dies. But if it's just normal or moderate or small, it can be preserved because materials will cover it. Remember, for an organism to be preserved, it must be buried. So materials must be there to cover it so that it remains to be preserved on rocks so that when we come now to study, we can now deduce that certain organisms live in a particular environment. Another condition that fosters or favors fossilization is the environment of formation. And organisms cannot be preserved in turbulent environment because the wave action will destroy some of the parts. And so the environment of formation is another good condition for fossilization to take place. For an organism to be preserved, it must have parts that are preservable. That is, it has hard parts such as bones, teeth, or it can have soft parts that have not been altered. Fossils can be preserved in different modes. And the different modes of preservation of fossils include, one, they can be preserved by refrigeration. They can be preserved by desiccation. And they can be preserved by amber. Amber is a resinous substance present in plants which gets the organisms stuck on the soft sediment for where it is to be preserved. We can see, for example, insects in amber. Another mode of preservation of an organism is by the hard part preserved without alteration. And this is done through the process of replacement and recrystallization. Fossils can also be preserved as trace fossils. That is, the remains of organisms that live in a particular environment are buried. And when we come after years to study, we may see these traces. And these traces exist as trace fossils. They exist as mold and cast. They exist as copolith. And they exist as gas through leaf. The picture that shows a typical example of the trace of an organism leaf in soft mud. And from this, that trace that we see can enable us to determine or deduce the particular environment, the particular organism that lived in that environment. How are fossils important? Fossils are very important, first, as stratigraphic indicators. They enable us to deduce the sequence in the deposition of rocks. Fossils are important are indi as indicators of ancient climate or paleoclimate. Fossils are also important as indicators of sedimentary environment. Other importance of fossils include fossils are indicators of paleogeography. Fossils are important in the reconstruction of the history of the Earth. Remember, very important. Geologists, especially stratigraphers, in collaboration with paleontologists, use fossils to rebuild the Earth's history. Where do fossils occur? Fossils can preserve only in fine green sediments. That's where they can easily be found. Now, do we have to realize that fossil, the fossil record has a gap? And this gap is as a result of orogenies, mountain building processes, which comes with a lot of energy. And this energy in the form of temperature, 
destroy. They come with a lot of frictional movement that will lead to grinding of the fossils. So they are not preserved. So when the activities occurred, some fossils or organisms that lived during that time were destroyed. And so hence, leaving the fossil record with gaps. So that's, those are the reasons that give reason which justify the gaps in the fossil record. How can fossils be classified? Fossils are classified based on the morphological features and ecological, ecological importance. Based on these two criteria, we have the following classes of or phylum of fossils. We have the mollusca, we have the brachiopoda, we have the echinodermata, we have the arthropoda, we have the hemicodata, and we have the selenterata. When we pick up a fossil to study it, what are the actual aspects of that particular fossil we will be studying? One, we must take the morphological features of the fossils. This will lead to the integration of the fossil into its phylum, class, and name. Two, we must be able to state the external features that will help us to identify or determine the mode of life of that organism. Three, we must be able to state the age or the age range of the fossil. That is, the particular time span during which that organism lived or thrived on the Earth's surface. And finally, we must take the stratigraphic significance of the fossils. That is, we use it to name the strata or strata, strata where those fossils exist so that it can facilitate the work of a stratigrapher. In this situation now, we are not saying that the relationship between a paleontologist and a stratigrapher is that the knowledge of a stratigrapher acts as an ancient knowledge for a paleontologist. Stratigraphy. Stratigraphy is the study of stratified rocks of the Earth cross. That is, rocks occur in a particular sequence from top, from bottom to top. And when we study rocks that are put down in layers, we are doing stratigraphy. And a layer could be called a stratum single, and when there are many, we call it strata. So when you study rocks in that particular sequence, you are actually doing stratigraphy. And to be able to study stratigraphy, what guides us is a geologic time scale, the dating method, and the stratigraphic contacts. The branches of stratigraphy include, there are so many branches, but we'll lose three for the purpose of this revision. We have little stratigraphy, which is a stratigraphy that deals with the study of rock unit, that is the lithology. And then we have biostratigraphy, which is the stratigraphy that deals with plant and animal remains. And chronostratigraphy, chrono from the word, chronolo, chrono, which is time. So this is stratigraphy which deals with the time unit. And so when you do any of these branches, you are studying the different aspects of stratigraphy. In studying everything in life, there are certain guideline, guideline principles. Just like in everything in life, stratigraphy has some guideline principles that we follow to be, enable us to come up with certain conclusions. And these principles include one, the principles of uniformitarianism. This principle is William Smith's first law, which simply states that the present is the key to the past. That is to say, the processes that are occurring today occurred in the same way in the past. So we can deduce what is happening today from what happened in the past. The second law of William Smith was the law of superposition. This law states that in a strata of undisturbed rock, the rocks that are found at the bottom will be the oldest, while those at the top will be the youngest. 
So there's a kind of age variation from bottom to top. So the those laid at the bottom are the oldest row, and then those laid at the top, the youngest row. So when we come across this, we can just come across a sedimentary strata, and we can use this method to determine the age of those strata by simply following this principle put forward by William Smith. The next law of stratigraphy is the law of cross-cutting relations. This law states that in a sequence of rocks, any structure that cuts the structure which was first of all deposited is younger than that structure which it gets across, such as dikes. As we can see on this diagram there, when you look at figure, the, the part level F is a dike. You see that F cuts bed G and bed E. Therefore, as it cuts bed G and bed E, bed E and G were already there before F was put in place. Hence, G, F is younger than the bed it cuts across. So to, when we are, are working the field, this principle guides us to attach edges to strata with this kind of displaced structures. Included fragments is another law. This law states that if you come across a sequence of rock and you find strata of varying age in that rock, that those fragments that are enclosed in the rock which has the bulk composition is they are older than the strata in which you find themselves. So for example, if you find particles of basalt in a sandstone, those basalts which are not the bulk composition of that outcrop are included fragments. And definitely for us to determine the age, the basalts that have come after the putting, the, the, the putting in place of the sandstone are older be, before the sandstone. And then we have funeral succession. This is a law which guides us to study strata and assign ages to strata by the use of fossils. So when we come across a strata of about bed A, B, and C, and we find a fossil around bed A, that fossil has the same age as bed A, because it means that the, the deposition of the fossil and the strata took place at the same time or contemporaneously. To record events, geologists have a calendar which the record of all events that have taken place on the surface of the earth have been noted. This calendar is described as the geologic time scale. The geologic time scale is a chart showing the order in which the rocks which have been formed through the geologic times are recorded. It is comprised of the aeons, the eras, the periods, and the epochs. The aeons are the largest time units of the geological time scale, and they are divided into two. We have the Cryptozoic Aeon and the Phanerozoic Aeon. The Cryptozoic Aeon is exemplified by rocks of the Precambrian age. The aeons are further subdivided into eras. And these eras are divided into three. We have the Paleozoic, which is the ancient life. We have the Mesozoic, middle life. And we have the Cenozoic, which is recent life. And the eras too are further subdivided into 11 periods from Cambrian to recent or tertiary. And finally, the period are equally subdivided or further subdivided into epochs. Now, the most important thing you need to hold firm on about this geological times is that one, it has two aeons, it has three eras, it has 11 periods. And you should be able to name all this. The aeons, you should not forget to name them. The Cryptozoic, the Phanerozoic. The eras, the Paleozoic, the Mesozoic, the Cenozoic, and the periods 
At the level of all levels, you may not be strained to act to, to list the 11 period, but just know that the, the geological time scale is broken down into aeons, eras, period, epochs. But I repeat, but you should take note that there are two aeons, cryptozoic, phanerozoic. You should know the eras, Paleozoic, Mesozoic, and Cenozoic. The 11 period, if you don't master them, is not much of a problem. Dating. Dating is the assigning of ages to rocks, and even in order to determine the history of the Earth. So what does this mean? It is simply the method used by geologists to assign ages to rocks and other geologic events so that we can be able to read the history of the Earth. And the methods of dating in geology include one, relative dating. This involves giving approximate ages to rocks. And the methods of relative dating are we use some major geologic events like folding and faulting, and even aneous intrusions. We can also use sedimentary structures to name geologic events. We use valve clays. Valve clays are the deposition that takes place in glacier lakes. And we know that in glacier area, in the temperate regions, deposition is according to seasons. During winter, deposition takes place, and during Summer deposition takes place. So we can follow the number of deposition that took place in the repeated occurrence of deposition in winter and summer, winter and summer repeatedly, and we can be able to trace how long deposition has taken place in a particular area. That's valve cleaning. But that is really actually relative. And we have the paleontological method, use of fossils to assign ages to rocks. The next method used for dating rocks is absolute dating. Absolute dating involves giving the precise ages of rocks in years. It is quite exact. It gives the exact ages of rocks. It's not approximately like relative dating. And absolute dating involves two methods, radiometric dating and non-radiometric dating. For radiometric dating, we are using the use of, we are using radioactive isotopes, so, such as alpha and beta decay, which we can calculate their half-lives to come out with the exact age of a rock. For those of you who are reading about geology and physics, you will know what we are talking about, how radioactive isotopes. And then a non-radioactive method involves the use of the valve clay analysis and tree ring dating. We just go to a tree that has been cut and we count the number of rings that that tree has. We can use it now to determine the age of the sediment in which that particular tree is preserved. Stratigraphic contacts. These are contacts of planes of irregular surface separating rock types. As rocks are deposited, they have a plane that separates either the younger series and the older series, or a plane that shows that the older series is inclined or the older series is folded. And when we come across this kind of situation in the field as geologists, we describe it as an unconformity. Unconformities are surface of erosion, weathering, or non-deposition which separates younger beds from the older beds. Types of unconformity. There are four major types of unconformity. We have one, angular unconformity. As we can see from diagram A on the board there. When we look at it, angular conformity is an unconformity which occurs when the older series are folded or tilted. And then we have younger series that lie above the older series, which are not folded or not tilted. And looking at that diagram A again, you look at the point where you have U on your, on your right and U on your left. That is a plane of unconformity. Remember we said 
stratigraphic contacts are play, irregular planes, which marks a period of non-deposition. The second type of unconformity is the heterolytic unconformity. Heterolytic unconformity, exemplified by diagram B, is an unconformity that arises, as you can see there, when younger rocks are laid on older rocks or they are laid on igneous or metamorphic rocks. And the plane of unconformity is shown by N on the diagram there. Non-depositional. This one is very tricky. But now how do we discover, or how can we say there is an unconformity taking, and that an unconformity has occurred here? When we look at the older beds, they have structures like basal conglomerate or bald surfaces. So where those basal conglomerate cuts, the older bed, the first bed down, and the bed that has striations is where we have the basal conglomerate. That is the plane of unconformity. Because it is not easy to identify this unconformity, stratigraphers term it non depositional unconformity, which means there was no deposition that actually took place. That's what they are simply saying. And they will have parallel unconformity. The parallel unconformity is another plane which shows irregular surfaces of non deposition. When you look at the first two older beds and the first younger bed, you show the irregular surface. That is the plane of unconformity. It is parallel. There is no inclination. There is no intrusion. And so because the older beds and the younger beds lie parallel, we call it parallel unconformity. The environments in which sediments can be deposited. Sediments can be deposited in two environments. By, and by two processes, by marine transgression and marine regression. Marine transgression is simply when the sea moves towards land. And regression is when the sea is retreating back to its position. Soils. Soil is a mixture of minerals, organic matter, gases, liquids, and microorganisms. And soils are formed by the weathering of rocks. So when rocks undergo weathering, either physical or chemical, and they have all these elements in them which combine together, they give us our soil. Now what are soils made of? Soils are made of Rocks, sand, clay, silt, air, water, and organic matter. How can we identify a soil? Or what can we use to, when studying soil to be able to qualify, quantify or qualify soils? One, the color, that's the characteristics of soils, the color, the texture, the structure, the porosity, that is the amount of empty spaces in the soil, the iron content, and then the pH of the soil. Types of soils. There are so many types of soils which we know. Here we are going to cite the sandy soil, the clay soil, the peaty soil, the saline soil, and the silty soils. Soils occur in layers, and the layers in which soils occur from the top to the bedrock is referred to as the soil horizon. And the soil horizon has layer horizon A, horizon B, horizon C, then the bedrock at the bottom, as we can see. So we should be very careful. Sometimes we go when there is road construction, we can see these layers well exposed. Now, these are the different layers. If you look at the plant, where the taproot ends marks the level of, marks the end of layer B. And from the end of the taproot down to the bedrock, we have our layer C, and then finally the bedrock. So those are the different layers or the horizon of a typical soil. We have horizon A, horizon B, horizon C, and the bedrock.
We have come to the end of our revision of phase four. Stay connected for revision questions and answers. The Ministry of Secondary Education has developed a distance learning platform in collaboration with MinPostel, CRTV, UNESCO and UNICEF for students of secondary education in Cameroon. A series of lessons taught by qualified teachers. For secondary school students, learning has never been easier with distance learning. An initiative by the Ministry of Secondary Education under the stewardship of Professor Polina Lovalunga in collaboration with the Ministry of Post and Telecommunications, CRTV, and UNESCO. And UNICEF. We are introducing distance learning as another teaching and learning method which is different from the traditional classroom setting that you are all used to. In the distance education mode, you are not with the teacher in person, so take your time, relax, listen to the teacher, take down notes and visit the following links for any questions or answers to your question. Take it in your stride. Nana Valunga, Minister of Secondary Education. Revision questions and answers will start always with the multiple choice type of questions. Question one, the remains or traces of one's living organisms buried and preserved in sedimentary rocks are called A, impressions, B, hard parts, C, fossils, D, corpses. We take a few, pause for a few seconds, reflect and choose the correct answer. When we come back, we look at the correct answer together. Our correct answer is C. Fossils are the remains of once living organisms that are preserved in sedimentary rocks. Impressions could be considered as footprints tool marks, which are also kinds, other kinds of fossils. Hard parts are one of the modes of preserving fossils, and corpses are not, or they cannot be considered as fossils because a corpse cannot stay. We remember that the definition of fossil, for an organism to be considered a fossil, it must have stayed for at least 10,000 years. So corpses are just out of place. Question two. Fossils with still living forms today are most likely to be A, extant fossils, B, extinct fossils, C, index fossils, D, zone fossils. We pause for a few seconds, and when we you choose your answer, when we come back, we we'll see the correct answer, all of us. Our correct answer is A, extant fossils. Fossils with present day representative are described in paleontology as extant fossils. Fossils without present day representative are described as extinct fossils, such as the dinosaurs. But for extant, we have Molochs. The gastropod that lived in the past, and we have gastropods today that still live. Example is a garden snail or helix aspersa. And index fossils are fossils that are located that characterize a particular horizon, but are not limited to it in time. While zonal fossils are fossils that characterize a particular horizon and are limited to it in time. C. Corals. Question three. Corals are good indicators of what environment? Yeah, they want to find out what are you know the environment for corals are preserved. So A, anaerobic environment. B, warm, shallow marine environment. 
see aphotic zones, D, unstable shorelines. We pause for a few seconds, and when we come back, we choose the correct answer together. The correct answer is B, warm, shallow, marine environments. Anaerobic environments are environments void of oxygen, where these organisms cannot thrive. So they will not be preserved there. A photic zone, here they are bringing the aspect of the different zone that occur in the ocean floor. So it is not a warm, shallow marine. It could be an example of an aphotic zone could be the littoral zone, and corals are not preserved in the littoral zone. Another example is the continental shell. Corals are not preserved in the continental shell. So they, and the unstable shorelines. The unstable shorelines are just like the beaches. So we cannot find corals there. Hence, the correct answer to this question is B, the warm, shallow marine environment. Question four, trilobites are good stratigraphic fossils because they are used A, as zonal fossils in the Mesozoic rocks, B, in naming rocks, C, as index fossils, D, in dating and correlating rocks. We pause for a few seconds and when we come back, we choose the correct answer. Okay, our correct answer is D. Trilobites are good stratigraphic indicators. So they are used in dating and correlating rocks at different localities. They cannot be used as zonal force because they are limited, they are restricted. And they cannot use them in naming force. We don't use only trilobites to name rocks. And because index fossils too are limited, are not limited to a particular horizon, then we cannot use them as good example for stratigraphy in the naming of rocks. Question five. The hard part of molluscs preserved as fossils are A, shells, B, cellulose, C, chitinous exoskeleton, D, woody tissues. We pause for a few seconds, and when we come back, we we'll choose the correct answer. Our correct answer here is A. There is no need to keep explaining B, C, and D because they already keep it out. They say hard part. Cellulose is not hard part. Chitinous exoskeleton is not hard part. Woody tissue is not hard part. But shells among the four responses that stand out clearly as the only hard part of molluscs preserved. The remain, question six, the remains of plants and animals buried in sedimentary rocks are known as A, extant fossil, B, extinct fossils, C, fossils, D, fossilization. We pause for a few seconds and when we come back, we look at the correct answer together. This, the, this question is also straightforward. The answer is C. Look at the key, the key word, remains of plants and animals. That's the definition of a fossil. So if you don't know the definition of a fossil, you cannot answer this question. So the correct answer is a fossil. Question seven. Bivalve is, a, is an example of A, A, Brachiopod, B, echinoderm, C, molluscs, D, graptolites. Pause for a few seconds, and when we come back, we'll see the correct answer together. Our correct answer here is C, molluscs. Here, they want to see if you understand or know the phylum to which the organism bivalves belong. So those are four different phyla, Brachypoda, Echinodermata, Molluxca, and Graptolida. So you see that bivalves fall in the phylum Molluxca. So the right answer there is C. Question eight. Lithostratigraphy 
is defined as A, the study of stratified rocks, the study of rocks based on rock types, the study of rock unit based on their fossil content, D, the study of the ages of rocks and their time relations. We pause for a few seconds and when we come back, we see the correct answer together. Our correct answer is B, the study of strata based on the rock types. Litho is referring to rock type. So lithology is rock type. So lithostratigraphy is a study, is a branch of stratigraphy which studies strata based on the rock unit. The study of stratified rock is simply stratigraphy. The study of rock unit based on their fossil content is biostratigraphy because fossil content, they, they are referring to either plants or animals. And because fossils are either plants or animal remains. And the, the study of the ages of rocks and their time relation is simply a concept in stratigraphy referred to as correlation or chronostratigraphy. Question nine. Fossilized domes of organisms are called A, pseudo fossils, coprolites, C, index fossils, D, trace fossils. We pause for a few seconds, reflect, and when we come back, we'll see the correct answer. Our correct answer is B. The fossilized dogs of organisms that are preserved, which enable stratigraphers to know the type of organisms that thrive in that area, are referred to as cropolites. Soda fossils, there's nothing like soda fossils. Index fossils are simply, they are not the fossilized dogs. And trace fossils are footprints, not dogs. Dogs is the physis of a once living organism or of an organism. So take note. The largest unit that geologists use to measure the age of the Earth is A, aeon, B, system, C, H, D, sequence. We pause for a few seconds, and when we come back, we choose the correct answer. I will see why the correct answer stands out as the best. Our correct answer is A. The largest unit is in the geological time scale is the aeon. So take note, it should remain in your head that the largest unit is the aeon. Question 11. What type of unconformity is separated by the figure besides? Take note, story the figure very carefully and take note of what has happened with the strata the younger series and the older series. A, angular unconformity. B, heterolytic unconformity. C, ancient. D, contact. Reflect, pause, and then choose the correct answer. We'll come back, we we'll see the correct answer together. Okay. Our correct answer is A, angular unconformity. Remember, we have two series of beds, the older lower series and the younger upper series. And an angular unconformity will always arise when older series of beds are either tilted or folded. And when you look at the figure in front of you, you realize that our older series is tilted and it is folded. Hence, the younger series lie now conformably on tilted and folded bed. And the best type of unconformity that can arise from this situation is an angular unconformity. So A stands as the best answer here. Question 12. Which principle states that the present is a key to the past? A, superposition. B, uniformitarianism. C, phonal inclusion. D, fossilization. We pause for a few seconds, and when we come back, we we'll look at the answers, the correct answer together again. OK. 
Okay? Our correct answer is B, uniformitarianism. It starts out very clear. The present is the key to the past was William Smith's first law, which is the principle of uniformitarianism. Superposition is the laying down of bed. There is nothing like funeral inclusion and fossilization is a process. Question 13. If most snails build their shells out of calcium carbonate, what type of fossilization has occurred in a fossil snail composed of silica shell? A, replacement. B, carbonization. C, alteration of hard parts. D, mold and cast. We pause for a few seconds and we come back. We choose the correct answer. Okay, the correct answer is A, replacement. The calcium has been replaced. So it is just when they, 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 one important thing I want to draw your attention when you are reading questions in an exam, take note of the terms in the question and the English, what it makes to you, the kind of sense it's bringing out. So most of you will be derailed by the fact of calcium carbonate to just balance. Calcium carbonate, you just run and take carbonization. And there is no, alt the hard part has not been altered. But it has simply been replaced. Calcium carbonate has replaced silica. So hence, the best answer for this question is replacement. It's not mold and cast. Question 14. Select a method of dating rocks which will not be given in terms of yes. A, relative dating method. B, carbon 14 method. C, absolute dating method. D, tree ring dating method. We pause for a few seconds, reflect and choose your answer. When we come out, we'll all see the correct answer. Okay, welcome back. The question is, the correct answer is A, relative dating method. Remember, relative dating method is a method of dating used in stratigraphy, which gives the approximate age. And the word or words in the question that talks about approximate is will not be given in terms of age, will not be given in terms of age, simply replaces approximate. So the correct answer is A, relative dating. Carbon 14 already gives the precise age. Absolute dating gives precise age. And tree ring dating, we can count the number of rings from the tree and give the precise age. So the only correct option there is A, which is a relative dating method. Question 15. The layer of the soil rich in organic matter is A, horizon B, Horizon C, Horizon A, and Horizon and the bedrock. The layer of the soil rich in organic matter is, I take it again, A, Horizon B, B, Horizon C, C, Horizon A, and D, the bedrock. We pause for a few seconds, and when we come back, we see the correct answer together. The correct answer is C, horizon A. Horizon A is a layer of the soil which is rich in organic matter. It is not very deep. It's not even up to more than one meter. So that particular layer of the airway we seal, which is not up to a meter and very dark, is what we refer to as the horizon A and it's rich in organic matter. Horizon B is Further than horizon A and horizon C is the layer between B and the bedrock. And B is where the taproot ends. Question 16. Which principle cannot be applied in establishing the geologic history of the section beside? A, 
superposition. B, cross-cutting relationship. C, further inclusion. D, unconformity. We pause for a few seconds, and when we come back, we look at the correct answer together. Our correct answer is funeral inclusion. Funeral inclusion does not exist. So it's which matter we are, are we referring to. So it's just off the track, just to derail you. We can use cross-cutting relationship because of the presence of the dikes. We can use superposition if we neglect the dikes and look at the laid down history of the beds that make up that area. And we can use unconformity based on the stratigraphic contact that exists between the lower series of beds and the upper series of beds. So since funeral inclusion does not exist, it's the only off method there. Essay type questions. Question one, list and define the four types of fossils. List and define the four types of fossils. That is, I want you to give four types of fossils. B, state two importance of fossils to geologists. The four types of fossils include index fossils, which are fossils that characterize a particular horizon and are widely distributed, but are not restricted in time to that horizon. A zonal fossil is, they are fossils that characterize a particular horizon and are widely distributed and are restricted in time to that horizon while transported fossils are fossils that have lived in a different environment and have been transported to another environment. While fasci fossils are fossils that are adapted to a particular fasci. Define the following stratigraphic terms. One, epochs. Two, aeons. Three, periods list the different types of unconformities. An epoch is the third order of geologic time. An epoch is a third order of geologic time unit or a very short unit of geologic time. So far, we have seven epochs, but I can emphasize this is just for knowledge. This is just for knowledge. At the level of the GC ordinary level, you just need to know how to define the epoch. But for those of you who continue with geology in lower say, you can then go further to know that the seven epochs include the Holocene, the Paleocene, the Paleocene, the Miocene, the Oligocene, Eocene, and Paleocene. And Aeon is the largest unit of geologic time. I would say there are just two. And the period is a second order unit of geologic time. And periods are divided into epochs. And examples of periods include the tertiary and Cretaceous. List the different types of unconformities. One, angular unconformity. Two, heterolytic unconformity. Three, non-depositional unconformity. Four, parallel unconformity. I want to reiterate really that this can be a trap. List the different types. Sometimes in the exam, they can pull it and then go now and add other ones. So you, but the point here is these ones are the four major types of unconformity. Then if you go in the exam, you say list the different types of unconformity, please don't limit yourself to these four. You name the other ones, overlap, overlap, overstep. But when they say major, Types of unconformity, you limit yourself to these four, which we have just seen for this revision. Define stratigraphy. B, name the branches of stratigraphy. C, give four types of soil common in Cameroon. D, what role, what role does a stratigrapher play in geology? 
Stratigraphy is the study of stratified rocks. The branches of stratigraphy include lithostratigraphy, biostratigraphy, and chronostratigraphy. The three types of soils common in Cameroon include clay soil, sandy soil, seal soil, and ferralitic soil. The stratigrapher helps in correlating rocks. That's his main role, to be able to compare rocks of different localities so that other geologists can understand how these rocks were put in place or deposited during the time of deposition. The stratigrapher also helps in dating rocks, giving the ages to each rock unit. The stratigrapher equally helps in establishing the concise history of the earth. We have come to the end of phase four of our revision. Our next revision phase will be on applied geology. See you in the next revision phase.